loud. Okay, cool. Great. Cool. So awesome. hi everyone, um, my name is Maya and I'm a senior PCA and just welcome everyone to this Brown Connect alumni video conversation and today we're going to talk with Sophia Walker who graduated a few years ago and um, she's going to tell us about what she does at LinkedIn. Cool. Hi everyone, uh, I graduated from Brown in 2017. Uh, like Maya, I was a PCA at the Career Lab and I moved out to San Francisco after graduating to join LinkedIn. And I work there uh, as part of a two-year rotational program called Strategy and Analytics, uh, which focuses on uh, business operations, sales operations for its first year. And then during the second year of the program, you get your choice of where you want to work within the company. So there's a lot of options uh, as part of the rotational program. Great. And can you tell us a little bit about what your day-to-day -day is? Yeah. Sorry, one second. <laughs> Oh, uh, sorry. My sister's calling from China. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You're all good. Oh, good. Okay. I'm back. <laughs> no worries. Let me just... Okay. okay. Sorry. Go ahead. No, you're good. So just, yeah, just talking about your day-to-day. -day. Yeah. So day-to-day, -day, um, it's going to be different depending on which rotation you're in and kind of where you are in the rotation. Uh, so something uh, that is different about most jobs is that every basically six months or so, I'm going through what we call a ramp period. Um, so the first two months of a job are always somewhat difficult because you're just learning the ropes, right? Um, so you spend a lot of time chatting with people, networking, um, kind of figuring out the lay of the land and the business line that you're working with. The current rotation that I'm in is product marketing. So I work directly with product managers, designers, engineers, uh, to build out MVPs or minimal viable products um, to test out into our user base. Uh, so that's for the new products that we're working on. And then for products that have already launched, we look at different ways to optimize them to make a better user experience for people on LinkedIn. Cool. And can you, that's really curious about like LinkedIn as a big tech company in um, San Francisco. And so how did you identify LinkedIn as a company that you wanted to work for? And like when you're at Brown, did you know that you wanted to go into the tech space? And yeah, like why LinkedIn? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So uh, I didn't really expect to go into tech. I did not expect to be on the West Coast. Um, I definitely thought I was going to be in Boston or New York City. Um, I spent my summers during Brown interning in finance and consulting to study economics. And in my mind, those were like the two paths to take. Um, and I, I, once it came to like my senior fall, um, I basically was like, okay, let me take a different approach. Instead of being really like one-sided in terms of my opportunities, let me consider like the gamut of the different things that I could do after graduation. So I applied to a variety of different roles in different industries. Um, and LinkedIn was actually one of the companies that reached out to me. So I had a LinkedIn profile and they emailed me on LinkedIn. This is the importance of having a LinkedIn profile because it actually works. Um, they emailed me on LinkedIn and told me about this program uh, and set me up with someone to, to talk to and kind of, it just went from there. So I didn't even, I hadn't heard about the program. I wasn't trying to work at LinkedIn. It all kind of happened through circumstance and, you know, just having the right network and being in like the right place at the right time. Oh, that's interesting. So they, they literally messaged you on the fun, on the messaging function on LinkedIn and offered you. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So I think um, actually what happens is that they messaged me over the summer and because I was busy during my internship, I hadn't checked my LinkedIn. So I actually responded like a month later <laughs> and I felt really badly because <laughs> uh, they had like invited me to this open house and I completely missed it. And I emailed the recruiter and apologized profusely. And I was like, I would still love to learn more. Um, and she was nice enough to, you know, keep in contact with me, even though I completely you know, drop the ball there. So okay. important to check your LinkedIn profile um, on a regular basis. Yeah, Sorry right. about this, my sister's calling again. <laughs> okay. And can you talk a little more about like the, uh, the timeline of that again? You said they, they messaged you, but was that in like April or May or was it in the fall? Like when exactly? Yeah. Like yeah, so that was in, um, I guess it was probably uh, July actually. So really in like the middle of the middle of the summer. So for a, a lot of business internships, um, a lot of business opportunities, 
postgraduate do their recruiting pretty early um, because they're oftentimes competing for the same group of students who are vying for the investment banking and consulting jobs. And those students oftentimes will get offers after their summer internships or will go through recruiting within like the first couple of months of school. Um, so it all happens pretty quickly, uh, but it totally depends on the types of opportunities that you're looking into. And as someone who's had experience in both finance and investment banking and now working at a tech company, what, and also on the different coasts, what can you say are kind of some of the similarities and differences there? Yeah, so New York is crazy. <laughs> uh, New York is busy. Um, it's nonstop. It's really exciting. Um, I would say it's definitely worthwhile doing a summer there because it'll teach you a lot about the, the type of environment that you like to be a part of and the type of uh, people you like to be around. I'm not saying that like everyone on, in, on the East Coast in New York is the same, but it's definitely a certain type of lifestyle. Um, here on the West Coast, now that I've been here for over a year, I can definitely compare and contrast. Um, I think people think of the West Coast as being like this chill environment, whatever that means. Um, and it is, it is chill in the way that people care about their life and well-being and wellness. I think there's a greater emphasis on that on the West Coast than there is on the East Coast. However, um, just like the East Coast, there's this kind of grind mentality. The difference is that like it's under like a surface layer of like caring about uh, the environment and making sure everyone's getting, you know, enough sleep and everyone's like going to yoga. Uh, so it, it's very different. Like uh, the, the grind is very overt in New York City. It's very obvious. Um, and on the West Coast, the grind is here too, but it's not quite as obvious. Interesting. And can you, is there like a different type of grind for like a tech company grind versus like an investment bank or consulting grind? Yeah. Uh, so I guess in my, from my internship experiences, I think sometimes it was hard to tap into why things were happening at such an intense pace, because it may not have been clear to you kind of um, the level of importance that this particular project really was. Like, what is the real you know, like what is really pushing people forward? It's like, are we just concerned because we don't want to lose this client? Okay, like why is that the end of the world? You know, like obviously you'll, you'll lose money on that side of things, but it's, it's sometimes harder to tap into the reason, like the, the why. Knowing the why of what you're doing, I think is really important. And I think sometimes in finance and consulting, you can lose sense of that why, which means you can, for me personally, I could easily lose motivation for what I was doing. Um, on the West Coast, since it's mostly you know companies where product is the the force behind everything, if you're really passionate about the product that you're working for, there's not really a question as to why why there's this um, why there's this rush to do things because there are competitors popping up all the time. Like so the startup scene here is just kind of insane. I mean, like they're they're popping up everywhere. You know, so companies can have a greater valuation within, you know, a couple months if they happen to get a good deal from some investors. And then all of a sudden they have some resources that you didn't think they would have had and they can come compete in the same field that you're playing in. Uh, so it just feels a lot more uh, gritty out here, I think, to a certain extent. And it feels more real because you can actually see, you know, your competitors like coming around the corner. So for example, I don't know if this has happened on the East Coast, but there's a scooter craze going on on the West Coast where there's like six different companies trying to like create this scooter monopoly. <laughs> and uh, in San Francisco in particular, it's like the playground of these companies. And so there's just a ridiculous amount of scooters just like littering the sidewalk. And eventually the city of San Francisco, you know, put its hand down and kind of and banned a couple companies from operating within the city. Uh, so it's, it's really cool just seeing how like these companies are trying to survive and create a business and it's happening right in front of you. You know, like you're on the front lines of the consumer. Um, and that's like, that is like the, e the business ecosystem that's on the West Coast. Whereas in New York, I think there, there's obviously some startups, but the, the big industries there are not going to be tech. Well, it's funny you talk about the scooter craze and that I think it obviously started on the West Coast, but they just came to Providence. Oh, really? <laughs> That's oh great. God. You got that from summer break, and there's, like, the jump bikes, like, all around Providence, and then people talk about, like, birds flocking to Providence. There's birds yeah. that are just, like, all over the streets now. It's kind of wild. Yeah. 
That's so funny. Yeah, my, my friend works at Lyme, so I was just at her office the other day, and it's, it's, it's really fascinating. I'm excited to come back to Brown and see all of that. I can't even imagine oh, it's, Providence being taken over by that. It's, like, super weird. It's super weird, but kind of fun. Cool. And can you tell me more about, um, yeah, like, the office environment, and, like, people talk about tech companies as kind of just being, yeah, like, nap pods and, like, free lunch and all this stuff. I mean, can you talk a little bit more about, like, what that's like and if you think that provides value to you know, and makes, makes your work more productive? Sure. Um, so all of those, the things you listed off are all definitely true at LinkedIn. So we have, um, we have meditation rooms on certain floors. You know, we have like reading areas. We have pods for people to work in. Um, we have, so the way LinkedIn works is that there's a huge downtown office in, um, in San Francisco. So think of like a, you know, 20 floor level skyscraper like your typical office building um, and then we have a campus that's in our south bay so in mountain view where a lot of like the big um <clears throat> tech companies are located and that's our headquarters and that's um probably looks more like what most people think of as a tech company it's a campus it has like seven different buildings you know people bike between buildings because sometimes they're kind of spread out um and so i think that gives you a more like I'm in a, I'm working for a tech company feel. Um, I work uh, in both offices. So the days when I'm in the, uh, the downtown office in the skyscraper, it doesn't feel like a, like a crazy difference from, you know, working in a different office. The main, the main difference is the, the colors, you know, like the, it's not like a gray environment where everyone's working in cubicles. There are no cubicles. It's an open seating plan, which I think, I think it's also just becoming more popular in, in workplaces in general. Uh, the open seating plan, the free food is amazing. Um, it actually makes a huge difference for me, for my productivity, the food does make a difference because I can just grab lunch and go. Um, and if I have to have like a lunch meeting, it's a lot easier to facilitate that if we all know where we're getting food at the same time. <laughs> we, we know when the lunch lines get long. It's, it's just easier as opposed to going out of the office and then coming back in. Um, other things that I think are great are having different workspaces. So sometimes people don't like to work at their desks. They like to work in almost a library type environment. And we do have a floor that's like that, where it's kind of known to be like a silent floor. Um, so there are, I think the, the best part about working at a company which has different office, office spaces and a different layout is that it's going to be a more um, welcoming experience for people who may not do their best work in a cubicle. You know, or some people may not do their best work in an, in an open environment where they can easily see everyone else. It might be distracting. Um, so I think the office has a little bit for everyone. And is it a typical, typically a nine to five work day? Um, for me personally, I usually try to do more eight to six. Um, I tend to be more of a morning person. Um, so I'd rather work in the mornings and work in the evenings. But it's, it's less so about the FaceTime aspect and how long you're showing face in the office and more so about if you're getting your work done. So there are a lot of people who will only be in the office for, um, I don't know, say like 10 to five, but like sometimes they'll go home and do their work remotely. And especially for people who have children, you know, they wanna get home at a good time. So the fact that LinkedIn has a really flexible policy around that, there really is no policy. It's just kind of like get your work done and all is well if you do that. <laughs> yeah. um, obviously for some people, part of their jobs is managing. So having a presence is important, um, but that's not necessarily going to be the case with every single person. And what's been your perspective working kind of on the business side of a tech company, as opposed to the engineer and like how much interface do you have with the other units? And um, yeah, what's your perspective on that? Yeah, so I think uh, the, the business operations function at LinkedIn has a variety of different teams underneath it. And some of those teams are tasked with working far closer with product and with engineering than uh, some of the other teams that may be on the enterprise side or on the sales side. Um, so I've had a chance to get a taste of both to a certain extent. Um, um, and for me, it's been a lot more fun to work at a company within, within um, a business role that's actually tied to the company. And what I, what I mean by that is in a non-advisory role. So my internships were in consulting, sales and trading, and investment management. Finance in general is a client service industry for the most part. 
Um, therefore the work that you're doing is at the hands of someone else. Like someone else is really controlling the, the deal because they're the ones who have come to you for help, right? Whereas if you're working in house at a company, there's a different sense of, for me, a different sense of ownership. And there's a different sense of excitement around what you're doing because you're directly impacting the, the, the company that you work for. Like you're building it out alongside everyone else. Um, and you get to see it grow over time as opposed to once a deal is closed or once a project is finished, you're on to the next one and the, and it's in the past. Um, it's somewhat transactional in nature. And I realized I didn't really like that, uh, that part of the work that I'm doing in my internships. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, like LinkedIn is a place where you can not only, if you want to have exposure to work with engineers on the business side, that's definitely possible. But if you realize you're someone who wants to be maybe a little bit more high level, you can, but either way, I think it's a better experience than working in an advisory role. <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome. And um, so as someone who's kind of had those experiences that a lot of Brown students typically kind of gravitate towards too, it's kind of cool that you can kind of compare and contrast those. And you talked a little bit more about your internships in the past, but can you talk a little bit about what like clubs or organizations and things you did at Brown? Sure. So what I did at Brown, um, I was pretty busy at Brown. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Um, so I think that my number one time consumer was running track. Um, and that was an amazing experience. So I ran track all four years at Brown. Um, I think the other thing that I was really involved in was the, the business world of things. So I was active in women in business. I was on the e-board for that club my senior year. Um, and it was just looking, I was really looking forward to like meeting more women who are, <clears throat> who are interested in finance or consulting or whatever that might look like. And one of the ways I was actually able to, to do that more was by joining Career Lab and working at Career Lab. So I started working at Career Lab my junior year, I believe, uh, and worked their junior and senior year. Um, and that was a great way to meet with people, hear about their career aspirations. And I realized I really enjoyed listening about what people's passions were and trying to help them figure out, you know, how they could translate that into a profession or into a internship or into like a role after college. Um, I also was a TA uh, for principles of economics. So I was a big econ nerd at Brown, uh, <laughs> really enjoyed, uh, I tutored people at econ. And when my junior year rolled around, I realized that um, I think I would be interested in TA. So uh, I met with a professor and expressed my interest. Um, I ended up getting that job for my senior year as well. So I think I also had like a scattering of other things that I did. I think I was a, I was a community advisor for one year through Res Life because I like couldn't find housing. And so I did that so I could get a room. <laughs> um, but like my main activities were, were track, women in business, uh, PCA or working at career lab, uh, and then tutoring slash teaching economics. Those were like my main things, I would say. Yeah. Awesome. Very cool. And do you have, kind of just can finish it up. Do you have any advice for people who want to follow a similar path to you and kind of, do you think anything at Brown, um, helped you directly at, um, LinkedIn or anything you would do differently? Any advice for people who kind of want to get to where you are? Mm, yeah. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of things that help me get to where I am. I think one is it's totally okay to use your summers to pursue something and then realize at the end of the summer, you don't want to do that thing. That is totally okay and actually a great use of time because then you don't have to waste the rest of your professional career figuring out if you want to do that one thing, right? Because you've already tried it, you can cross it off the list and then you can pivot. Um, I pivoted at this point like at least three times before getting the role that I'm in now. And I'm probably going to pivot a couple more times in my career. I think it's just a, it's almost like a good muscle to flex to know, to kind of be reflective with yourself and say, okay, like what parts of that experience did I like or did not like and take note of that. I think it's always a good, um, a good uh, habit to take at least like a week or so if you can, before you go back to school to really reflect on the uh, professional experience you had and not only to like de-stress and get ready for the school year, but also to really take note of it. Cause it's really easy to lose track of that when you come back to school and then all of a sudden you're into your homework, your midterm, whatever, and you 
you start losing, you know, the, the insights you might have gathered during your internship. So I always had like a notebook where I would like write notes about things um, as they came to me. And I think it's always, like I still have that notebook and I still sometimes look back at it to remember, um, you know, like just keep track of the things that I'm interested in because they may not always occur in every role you have. But at the end of the day, if you have like this list of things you like to do, it'll be so much easier to determine like what your next step should be or what your next step should look like. Um, take, this is like a plug for Engine 1010, but it's like one of my favorite classes. And Professor Warshe is awesome. And he has this thing called the lecture. Um, anyone who's been in this class knows about this, but it's a really great reminder that there is more to the world than Goldman Sachs and McKinsey. Um, it is really hard coming out of uh, Ivy League school like Brown and feeling like you shouldn't be doing those things, unless it's like completely not in your interest. But if you're remotely interested in business, um, it's like an easier path to take because it's so outlined. You know, they come to campus, they recruit, you throw your name down, you throw your resume down, you get an interview. It's like the process is all outlined for you. And what is so much harder is for you to create your own path. Now, I'm, just, I'm not saying that going to Goldman Sachs or McKinsey isn't a good move. Obviously, they're fantastic firms and companies. But I think so many of us, including myself, put myself in this box that there weren't any other options aside from those companies um, and felt like I didn't really know what else I could possibly do. So I feel like I just got lucky, to be honest, that LinkedIn reached out to me and it turned out to be a really great fit. Um, but looking back, if I was going to give advice to my junior or senior year self, I would say like, I, I try to do this to the best of my abilities, but really like take a broad look at all of the different things you can do. You don't even really need to go into the workforce right away, unless you have financial um, constraints, which many of us do. Um, if you feel like you're not ready and you're still trying to look like maybe teach for a year, maybe do an externship for a year. It's, there's no rush necessarily to put yourself on a certain path. Um, and I think your, your early 20s are definitely a time to explore. And for me, moving out across the country, joining a tech company that I like, wasn't planning on doing, <clears throat> that was my version of exploring. Um, so I think if you look at it that way, you can put less pressure on yourself um, and really enjoy the process because it should be exciting. I really think that life after college is so much better. No offense, but it's so much better. So um, be excited about graduating and be excited about the different opportunities out there. And, and don't feel like you're in a rush because the opportunities will come. Um, you just need to make sure you have your eyes open for them. Awesome. Awesome. That was awesome. I love the point about the, the journal too. That's a really, really good tip. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Great. Okay. Well, I think we're, um, any, if you, unless you have any final thoughts, I mean, that was amazing and people are going to be really excited to hear this. So, um, anything else that you want to add before we uh, stop recording? Um, if anyone has any questions, um, you can feel free to find me on LinkedIn. Um, I don't know if my name is written in on any of this, but my first name is Sophia. It's S-A-F-I-Y-A. -I -I Last name is Walker. Um, and well, you'll see the person with the blonde hair and that'll be me. <laughs> so feel free to add me on LinkedIn. Happy to answer any questions. Amazing. Okay. I'm going to stop recording, but then Sophia, can you stay on for just a second? Sure. Cool. Thank you, everyone.